Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. Hi, I'm Eden Lane. Thanks for joining me for In Focus. We're in the lobby of the Ricketson Theater for opening night at the Denver Center Theater Company for Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike. But tonight we're going to give a tour of the new exhibit at the Arvada Center Galleries. It's the 19th, 20th, and 21st century landscapes. We met Arvada Center Exhibition Coordinator Kristen Bube early on a Saturday morning to learn about her first time out as sole coordinator and get a tour. Well, this is kind of a fun reason to come in on a Saturday morning. I know you have other things going on here today, but I really appreciate this personalized tour of this wonderful new exhibition that you curated on your own. Yes, yes. It's your first time doing the whole thing by yourself. Right, exactly. Yeah, normally there's, you know, just two of us full-time on staff and we work really closely, but this one was definitely um, a project that I would wanted to take over and... So it was great to have How did that happen? Do that. How did this become your solo exhibition as the curator? How did that happen for you? Well, in school, I studied a lot of Western art, especially the landscape painters. Um, and so I just had that knowledge and this passion to really tackle a so few century show. So you just spoke up and said, I would like to take this on, on my own? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just had such an interest in it and a passion for it that, and we've had a lot of other stuff going on, and so I think, you know, <laughs> my coworkers were like, definitely, go for it. If we don't have to work on this, that's great. So. <laughs> yeah, because you, you do these major exhibitions several times a year, mm -hmm. um, so everybody really has their, their hands full. What was, the, what was the idea when you said, I want to do this all on my own, and they said yes, then what was your first thought? I was just very excited. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Did the did the scope of it um, ever overwhelm you as you started digging into it, or was it just full-on excitement the whole time? It was mostly excitement, you know, definitely a little overwhelming, and well, now which artists, which pieces to include, but, you know, just digging into it and really getting involved, it really became clear who was important, who needed to be included, and... That's so a little it different when it's just your decision, isn't it? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> what went into deciding, I mean, it was clear that it was going to be chronological, 19th, mm -hmm. 20th, and 21st century. But as you did that, what went into making those selections about how you would focus each of those exhibitions? Well, the 19th century, we already had a collection in-house. Um, so that made that easy. It was just choosing from that collection. Mm -hmm. The 20th century... There was a lot going on here in the 20th century in terms of art and things like that. So just looking into where those artists were, what collections they were in, and finding out who was important. And that went into that. Um, in the 21st century, you know, I mean, you come across some artists over time that you, you always keep in the back of your mind for, okay, one day when we do a show like that, they, they need to be included. Oh, wow. But, and then, you know, it also takes a little more research as well to find some newer artists that you haven't yet come across. Well, I know it's a busy, busy Saturday morning, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to make sure we get through each section. Yes. Can we just take the sort of logical step and start with the 19th century? Yes, I think that makes the most sense. And that's in the theater gallery, right? Right, so exactly. Okay. So this is the theater gallery, and this is where you've started the collection, the, the, the exhibit. This yes. part is the 19th century. Right. So yes. tell me about this section. So this actually started in 1985, I believe it was. Um, a local collector, this is, had been his passion for his life, was collecting these 19th century expedition prints. And he was really enthusiastic about getting them shown, so we did an exhibition of the prints in 1985. All of these then, or just some of these? I believe it was most of his collection, most. which mm -hmm. there are about 300 or so in the collection. So this is a very small a slice of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we did another exhibition exhibition in 2011 of a larger chunk of the collection and since then uh, we've been holding the collection for in partnership with the family just because they don't have the space and resources to hold it you know it's a it's a lot <laughs> of pieces yeah um, to cram in a basement so we've been holding it for them and so that show came out of you know that partnership with them and are these mostly hand drawings 
A lot, they're all prints. They're prints. So in the 19th century, artists would go out, they would sketch the scenery they were commissioned to do. They would make a painting or a drawing maybe, but then they would give them to print houses that would make them prints and mass produce them. So they were published and the whole country saw them, which is why these are so important, is they really helped define the West in America in the 19th century. Were they, would they have been published in an ephemeral way, like a magazine or a newspaper, or were they more permanent, like in a book? Um, it varied, really, in all of those things. They were in newspapers, magazines. Um, the government commissioned a lot of these on their reports. Wow. They were in government report books. Um, so yeah, they, they were all over the place. <laughs> what do we know about the kinds of artists that produced the pieces that are in this collection? So some came over from Europe even as scientists to do these explorations of these new lands that people have heard of in Europe. And um, so there was you know, that angle, and then there were some that were just artists who wanted to go and see these new landscapes and get them out to the public. Um, those are artists like Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran, who were two of the great marketers of the 19th century, is really what I like to tell people. I think you can see a difference in the approach, too, but from yeah. the scientists to the artists that were capturing what they saw. Exactly, and even a lot of the artists that just went along with military expeditions were part of the military, but back then, artistic training was a part of your military training because you had to document what you were seeing, so. They didn't have cameras, even right. even though cameras existed, they didn't have them out in that kind of right. environment so easily. Yeah, it was really cumbersome. So. Are there any pieces in particular that when we walk through this section of the exhibition that we should pay attention to? Oh yeah, there's a lot. Um, you know, there's artists like Carl Bodmer, who was one of the first artists to document everything, and his are right along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, which early on in the 19th century, that was the West. So you see this kind of, you know, <laughs> which really isn't the West anymore, and then all of a sudden it just explodes over into California, Colorado, Utah, all these places that mm -hmm. have this amazing, amazing scenery. Anybody else that really sticks out that we should take a peek at or make sure that we, we linger over as we walk through? Yes, um, there's also, you know, like I said, a lot of people just wanted to get this amazing scenery out there. So there's artists like Alfred Matthews, who just went out, made pictures, published a nice like coffee table book essentially is oh, what wow. we called it. So there's also, you know, that perspective and you can kind of see the difference in really the documenting and the artistic representations of a lot of these artists. And because this was the 19th century, um, not only did the landscape look a little, yeah. little different at the time, but the way they would depict it was very different. Exactly. So the next space we'll go to skip the whole century. Exactly, yes. <laughs> So uh, there's a couple of different things that I notice right away when we get into this section. Um, first is there's so much more color. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, this clearly is not just one collector like the 19th century section is. Right, yes. Yeah. So this comes from three different collections. Uh, so we have the Kirkley Museum of Fine and Decorative Art. We've got a lot from their collection, a lot from the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center and then um, two local artists who have a large collection, Tracy and Sushi Felix. So this exhibition focuses more on the beginning of the 20th century. By the mid 20th century, abstraction, things like that had taken over and landscape kind of, it was still there, but it fell out of mm -hmm. you know, popularity. So this is a bit earlier, and a lot of these artists came to Colorado to study here. Uh, we were lucky that we had a lot of different art schools and actually the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, who a lot of the show is from, used to be the Broadmoor Art Academy. Right. And so a lot of these artists were teachers, students, I mean, just came to take summer classes. It was a like nationally renowned So is more of this collection uh, depicting more of Colorado than the previous collection? Yes, yes. Um, a lot of this is in Colorado. There's a few from New Mexico because this, you know, this region. It was so close by. To yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Colorado, New Mexico. I mean, those were really the heights of this landscape painting that was happening in the 20th or the 20th century. You can see that some of it looks much more pastoral or mm -hmm. or even literal. But then we get into pieces um, that are like the ones behind you. Right. So tell me about where we can see that that shift in style in this exhibition. Well, it kind of starts with a little bit of kind of impressionistic painting um, that was really big in Europe at, towards the end of the 19th century and kind of carried into the beginning of the 20th. So a lot of these landscapes are very, you know, free form. 
And that was also stemming from the fact that these artists were taking their materials and their canvases out into the landscape to actually paint right there, you know, that plain air painting. So they were capturing the feeling that they were experiencing while they were there as opposed to trying to recall it. Exactly, exactly. And then, you know, more art movements took over, such as kind of abstraction or surrealism, even maybe a little bit, not too much not in yet. this exhibition. Right. Mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, these new art movements that were happening were really starting to influence these pieces. And whereas in the 19th century, artists were really trying to document and, you know, show what the West was, here, these are artistic depic depictions first. That was their goal. This, this space is so much larger, and so are some of the pieces that are in here. Uh, you not only have room, but maybe it was much more of the idea that artists were working in larger formats as opposed to working almost as journalists and documentarians in the previous century. Yeah, exactly. And as you go through the whole exhibition series, you'll see, you know, 19th century, very tiny. 20th century starts to get bigger. There's still some tiny ones that they were taking out into the field with them, but then they were going back to their studio and making these bigger pieces. And then by the time you get to the 21st century, everything's just huge. <laughs> everything's huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. What are some of the other things that we should notice as we walk through this section in the upper gallery? Up here, I think it's important to notice all the different media. So in 19th century, you go from just prints, and here there's paintings. Prints from drawings that they were doing maybe with pencils or exactly. ink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so up here, there's still some prints. There's also some sketches, some watercolors, paintings, and then there's artists experiencing with the new material, experimenting with new materials, like Ruth Todd, who was mixing sawdust into her oil paints to really express that to texture. Get, mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there pieces in particular that we should make sure that we won't miss when we walk through this section? <laughs> yeah, so we have a wonderful group of Charles Bennell works from the Felixes. Um, there's some pieces by Boardman Robinson, who was the director of the Broadmoor Art School for a long time. Um, so his pieces are really important to have in this exhibition. Yeah. Um, there's some really great artists like Frank Vavra. We've got uh, uh, Vance Kirkland and William Sanderson. Um, there's a lot of really great Colorado artists in the show. So it's not, it's not uncommon for the Arvada Center to um, borrow and collaborate with the other galleries inside of Colorado and sometimes even outside of Colorado. What was that like pulling this collection together in the upper gallery that really sort of depicts Colorado in this way? It was really great and it was great that these institutions are so willing to partner with us because they have the greatest collections of Colorado art because they've been established here for so long. And so having their enthusiasm, because a lot of these pieces in this show have never been maybe shown at their home museum. <laughs> so sometimes they're, they're just locked away, uh, being safeguarded, but not on display. Exactly. Yeah, you know, these museums with huge collections, they can't show everything all the time. So it was really great to see some of these pieces that maybe, you know, haven't been seen at their museum yet. Did you get a chance to, to visit their, their archive to to help select what would fit the best in this in this exhibition? We, we worked closely and they would send me images and you know having an idea of what artists were important and what I needed you know I knew what definitely was out there. So that's a very um, modern day way to collaborate with other institutions is to send images back and forth as yeah. opposed to going to visit. <laughs> right yeah and you know I have you know over past collaborations we've definitely been to these collections as well. But not necessarily but visiting through the archives where exactly. something isn't on display. Exactly. Yeah. Was there something that you discovered in that process that was a big surprise to you? Um, there were a few artists that I kind of didn't know too much about to begin with, but as I did more research on how important they were to the scene, it was really, really interesting. Um, and how people came to Colorado, that story was also really interesting. But. Um, there's a lot of artists traveling with grants, or a lot of artists actually came here because of health reasons. TB, we were such a center for oh, wow. people to come to with TB, and so a lot of artists came here that way as well, which was really interesting. Do any of the artists that, that surprised you, that you learned about, come to mind? Can you give me an example? I could mention Ruth Todd. She was a really big name in New York who studied with a lot of the well-known 20th century artists mm -hmm. who came here for her health. and. Um, her pieces, you know, we've got a more traditional piece and then we've got a little bit more of an abstract piece on her side. So it's really great to see those two different expressions of the landscape. From and her. something she might not have captured had it not been for a, a physician recommending her come to Colorado. Right, right. What an amazing collection that you've been able to pull together. This exhibition is 
really demonstrates the change, not just in the way the landscape was viewed, but in the art movement of the time. Right. Really great job up there. Thanks. So there is so much exuberance in this section, which kind of matches the change in the art world as the century changed. What was this like to put this collection together for you? So this show is very fun to put together because a lot of these artists are local. There's just a few that aren't. And so you really got to work with the artists one-on-one, -on -one, really understanding what the pieces meant to them and what they were about. So this was a really fun show to put together. And of course we notice the color really ramps up down here, not in every painting, but in, in, in its totality, but also the change in media that they're right. using. Yeah, there's a wide range of media down here. We have ceramics, we've got collage, painting, it's everything. <laughs> what, is, what is the most unusual piece um, that, that you were able to uncover for this part of the collection? Well, I really wanted to try and find the digital expression of the landscape because obviously we're in the 21st century and mm -hmm. digital is a huge part of the landscape. So one piece by Bo Carey, a video piece that we included, was a really fun one to stumble upon uh, because it's really playing with color and how our eyes actually see the landscape. And it's just a fun piece. And it's displayed as a video piece right here in this gallery. Right, yes. And some of these other pieces um, really almost look photographic. Are some of them photographs? There are some photographs, yes. Um, there's one photographer, Brenda Biondo, who takes kind of a micro and macro view at the landscape, so really calling out plants that are in the landscape mm -hmm. that normally we would have taken advantage of. I mean, they're grasses, they're trees, they're things that you don't really think of. That's a great way to look at the, uh, an interesting take on a landscape, because we yeah. often think of a vista exactly. as opposed to, that, yeah, that's really it's just the one plant that you find, yes. Um, there's another photographer, Denis Ruzel, who actually recreated William Henry Jackson, a 19th century photographer. He recreated his path through Colorado and actually took tintypes, the actual photography method that was done in the 19th century. So he recreated this entire 19th century process, but in the 21st century. Oh my so goodness. that's very interesting. How would you even find the technology to be able to do that now? How would you find that support? Yeah. Did you get to discuss it with the artist? Yeah, he, um, you know, he really wanted to recreate it to the end, and instead of a mule, he rode a motorcycle, he said. But that was his only that concession. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Oh, so as we, look, as we look around, of course, this is your largest gallery. This mm -hmm. is your main gallery. But we really see um, the diversity of expression in, in this section that's currently happening in, in art movements, no matter what the subject. Tell me a little bit about how this collection came together. So when I approach the subject of landscape, that can mean so many different things in the 21st century because the landscape is full of buildings and human influence and so many mm -hmm. things. But I really decided to focus on pieces that looked at the land as the land. So there's little to no human evidence in any of the pieces in this exhibition. Um, and that was my choice to really look at the land. Um, you set up that parameter that helps you sort of focus in on what this exactly, would be. Exactly, exactly. Because you could have an entire show on cityscapes. You could have an entire show on suburban land. I mean, it's there's mm -hmm. so much out there. So this show really narrowed it down. And, you know, finding these artists was really fun because you get to look for so many different media. And a lot of these artists will work in different media in their own practice as well. So, getting so they might do some photography, they might do some oil, they might do some sculpture or metalwork or... Right. That's right. the nature of artists now. They, they feel freedom exactly. to try all sorts of media. Exactly. Yeah. And so just experiencing how these artists depicted the landscape was also great. Um, one of the artists who's based in New York that isn't one of the locals, but we got through a local gallery, his process is very unique and he completely fabricates his landscapes in a 50 gallon fish tank and then fills it with water and photographs it. So it's photography of an entirely made up place, but countless people are like, well, where is that? And it's like, well, actually, it's not even real. They're little craft trees, you know, and rocks and things. What was his inspiration so that it could be identified as a Western landscape? 
Well, he, his body of work really works with how to create an environment that, that is what it is, or that is his inspiration. And this one just happens to look a lot like the Western landscape. So. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's really clever that you were able to extend the definition to include that so that we could see not just how the depiction of the landscape has changed, but what's changed in the world of art. Right, exactly. What are the kinds of pieces that are really sticking out to you that you want to make sure that we don't miss as we walk through this vast part of the exhibition? Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, all the artists in here are wonderful. Um, two of the artists that could not have not been included in this exhibition are Tracy and Sushi Felix, who's part of their collection we borrowed from upstairs. Mm -hmm. They've been working in landscape for a very long time, have been established in the community for a long time. So their paintings are both in here. Um, and they're just wonderful, large vistas that really are really speak to people. And uh, except for the artist that you called out that was imaginary, are most of these Colorado or are they outside of Colorado also? Meaning the, the landscapes they depict? Yeah, some are. A lot of them are also just fabrications or generalizations. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of artists that harken back to the 19th century tradition, so they're pulling in these same places that the 19th century artists depicted, and a lot of those are in the Colorado region, surrounding region. Um, but some places are just a landscape, but a lot of places here are inspired by Colorado because Colorado does have wonderful landscape and scenery. It, it just, it's natural that landscape painting happens here. Now this piece on the floor behind you, that's one of the things that on opening night, uh, when we were here for your reception, really captured people's attention. What can you tell me about that piece? So that piece by Chandler Romeo, um, she's been working in ceramics for a very long time in the community and it's... Here in Colorado? Yes, yes, Colorado. And so it's a series of hers that really takes a look at the aerial perspective of landscape. Which, which is, is why you display it on the floor. Exactly, <laughs> yes. And that's also, you know, more of a 21st century part mm -hmm. of artistic representation is going aerial. I mean, it's not really something the artists did in the 19th and 21st century. If they did, century. they were on the cliff looking out, not down. Exactly, and yeah, not straight bird's eye perspective. And so the piece on the floor is from her plane series. So it's all these little vignettes of what you would see if you like flew over the plains. There's the circles on the farms that you know anyone flying out of DIA can see. Yeah. You know, um, and just you know hills and it's very. They're all single colors, so it really makes you feel like you're above it because you're so far above it. You can't really see too many details. And each you, one almost looks like its own little piece, but then they exactly. all add together to create a, a larger piece. Exactly. Yeah. So that one was a really great one to include, kind of get that 3D element of landscape art. As, as you took on this challenge of your first, uh, being the curator of all three galleries mm -hmm. on your own for the first time, what was the biggest lesson you learned of tackling this immense project? I think, you know, the biggest lesson oh, is if you could have 10 years, that would be great because there are so many artists, so many, but it just, you know, unfortunately, even though we have so much space, it fills up and you can't include many more artists. And I think that was the hardest part, but to be the person who has to make that final yeah, call. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh man, I found you a little too late, but uh, it's okay. Well, I, I have to congratulate you. Not only was the opening reception a wonderful reflection of the success, but just walking through, even in quiet moments like today, I can really see the thought and the heart that went into this project, and I just want to congratulate you. Well, thank you very much. The exhibitions run through November 16th, and details are online at ArvadaCenter.org. Earlier this month, Colorado's creative community suffered another great loss when Randy Weeks, president of the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, passed away in London. The next evening, the organization he led honored him in the tradition of the theater. Here's a look at their short film to document it.
Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for joining us for this evening's performance. We are saddened by the death of our president, Randy Weeks. He was an extraordinary man who entertained us with more than 400 Broadway and cabaret shows over the past 25 years. As part of our Denver Center family, please join us in a moment of silence as we pay tribute to an extraordinary man. As we pay tribute to Randy Weeks. Thank you. Randy's favorite theatrical expression was, the show must go on. In that spirit, we dedicate this evening's performance to Randy Weeks. To Randy Weeks. To Randy Weeks. Tributes to Randy Weeks and his work continue to pour into the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. Earlier this week, Pippin, which just launched its national tour at the Denver Center, dedicated their entire tour to the memory of Randy Weeks. You can join the Denver Center for the Performing Arts family as they celebrate the life of Randy Weeks on November 3rd at 4 p.m. in the Buell Theater. The details are available at denvercenter.org. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. Good night.